This is mostly Anissa's work uh, that we're presenting on today, uh, but I'm just going to give a little bit of context for this project uh, and sort of set Anissa up. Um, so as Chris said, I'm Sarah Day Thompson. I'm the digital archivist at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and this is a little project, well, quite a big project actually in the end, um, that we've been working on um, for the past sort of four to five months. If you want to go to the next slide, Anissa. So what it is, uh, is called the Carmichael Watson uh, Project, which was undertaken uh, between about 2007 and 2017. So it's spanned quite a long time um, and is largely formed of collections from the Centre for Research Collections, but also has collections from the National Library of Scotland and a, a couple other places. Um, it is mainly the papers of the Santa Claus looking fellow in the top right hand corner, folklorist Alexander Carmichael, who lived from 1832 to 1912. Uh, so largely analog things have been digitized, uh, but includes a really rich corpus of materials, uh, mainly from Gaelic speaking areas of Scotland, from stories to little charms and songs, information about customs, beliefs, uh, and then quite a lot of physical artifacts uh, that are digitized and included in this collection. If you can go to the next slide, please. So the background uh, to this web archiving project um, is to say that the project as a whole, including this uh, web resource, uh, was in total £750,000, at least investment by the Leverhulme Trust and the AHRC, so quite a big investment, not to mention um, quite a lot of staff uh, time and a lot of collaborations with researchers, uh, quite a big investment in the digitization of this archival material, uh, and the website was developed because um, the archivist and other project staff uh, realized that these materials were not really as accessible as they could be to the communities um, in these Gaelic speaking parts of Scotland, as well as the groups uh, interested in teaching using these materials. Um, so the website was really designed to make this content more accessible uh, and includes quite a lot of specific functionality uh, and improved user experience. And it's worth saying that it had, uh, when it was online, live on the web, it's a very popular resource with a very engaged uh, stakeholder group. If you want to go to the next slide. Um, so then, then my part comes in. Uh, so uh, basically what happened is the original website's uh, hosting infrastructure became obsolete and a security risk. Uh, and it was hosted by kind of a slightly separate entity within the University of Edinburgh as these things go. Um, and when the original hosting infrastructure was turned off, uh, it was the code was evaluated and could not be ported over to a new server. It was taken offline in 2018 and moved on to a virtual machine, Red Hat 5, uh, which then itself became obsolete, uh, but was still incurring annual license fees. Um, so at this point, uh, when I came, was asked uh, if there's anything that we could do, and the archives team uh, found that the UK Web Archive capture uh, which you can see below. So that's the content hosted on the VM is the one uh, that looks complete with the green uh, color scheme. And the one below was the UK web, the most recent UK web archive capture. So there were some problems with it uh, that might have been fixed, but not in the time scale that we had before um, our um, IT people wanted to turn off the VM. If you want to go to the next slide. So the preservation strategy uh, that I proposed at uh, very short notice. Um, was first of all to secure the virtual machine uh, behind the VPN, so that was actually our library systems development um, sort of strategy, uh, but then to do some testing uh, at the time with Conifer, but then also archiveweb.page. And as you can see in the two screenshots below, the top image is um, from the original uh, or from the content hosted on the VM and the one on the bottom, what was captured with archiveweb.page, just in my little bit of testing. Um, at the time, um, we had no in-house capacity to do a full manual capture, so we decided to contract a freelance web archivist and work began uh, planning mainly in July 2021 uh, so that we could create a sustainable set of archival materials uh, in a preservation standard format uh, and then also have this opportunity to kind of experiment a little bit with how we can preserve our own web-based resources uh, and collection materials uh, and then increase our capacity in web archiving. Uh, and that is where Anissa came in, who is our uh, web archivist actually undertaking this work for us. Okay. So um, during the past few months, I've been collaborating with the University of Edinburgh to preserve the Carmichael Watson project 
web resource. I use archiveweb.page, which is a free open source web archiving tool created by Web Recorder. It's available as a standalone desktop app or as a browser extension in Chrome. The screenshots and reflections I'll be sharing today very much represent a web archiving project in progress. Before I begin creating any web archive, I make a very detailed map. Um, my knowledge and understanding of a website and structure determine how I approach its capture. The map informs how I plan my capture sessions, helps me to plot against which, um, sort of plot milestones against which I'll track my progress and provides a wayfinder for retracing back to review my work. Only by establishing the relative positions of a site's subsections and charting their spatial dispersal, will I be able to be certain at the end of the archiving process that I've actually traversed its full extent. An initial close to the surface scan of the site revealed more than 3,000 catalogued objects across three collections. The Carmichael Watson project brings together holdings of the West Highland Museum, the National Museum of Scotland and the University of Edinburgh. Additionally, with a rough tally, I counted almost 4,000 entries in the indexes, which cross-reference the names of people, places, subjects and ideas that are embedded within the material. As I began mapping in more detail, I realised that the Carmichael Watson Project web resource has an unusually complex construction. I found multiple URL sequences running in parallel. In fact, I identified between six and ten different URL sequences intersecting each record. I observed that half of those variations resolved to identical pages, but I knew that all of the sequences would need to be captured to facilitate intuitive browsing in the archive. The website's convoluted architecture compounded the task ahead, so the scale of this capture would far exceed our initial expectations. I used Excel to plot out each sequence and began visualising the website as built in a series of very tall columns, noting anywhere I found gaps or hops in the sequences. I worked steadily, reviewing my progress in Archive Web's index of pages. I expand Archive Web's information panel in the upper right so that I can check the number of pages I've captured and use the catalogue reference numbers as milestones to delineate my sessions. But as my collection grew larger, I noted that the index became less reliable. Pages I'd captured seemed to be missing. Um, I'd perform direct searches to confirm that the missing URLs had in fact been captured. I realised that when building an archive of this kind of scale, my quality assurance and capture needs to be simultaneous. I changed the colour of the URLs I've captured to keep track of where I am. After capturing a full notebook, I routinely perform a search of the URL index to retrieve and review a full sequence of pages. I mark my progress with each back cover scan. One of the fundamental tenets of archiving using the Web Recorder tool suite is the principle of performativity. Any actions you want to be performable in the archive must be performed during capture. 
there's a necessary mirroring between the functionality activated by the archivist and the functionality an end user of the archive will be able to access. And the explorable spatial extent of the archive is delineated by the archivist's definition of its boundary during capture. But something that I haven't needed to articulate within this framing until now that has very much come to the fore in this case is that the intuitive browsing potential within the archive is also dependent upon an archivist's acute attention to all the possible pathways a user might take through it. Hadn't expected that the direction from which a user, a user navigates their pathway through a website would matter, but in this case I found that it did. The Carmichael Watson catalogue records are richly appended with tags. These enable researchers to cross-reference the people, places and ideas which link different parts of the collection together. Each of these tags represents a link to an entry in one of several detailed indexes. Then each index offers a portal of associated notebooks and objects that researchers can browse and through which they can choose to navigate back into the collections. The unusual thing I noted was that these paths which lead from tags or indexes back to the same object in the collection don't resolve to the same URL, rather they each contain a reference of their journey. To capture these indexes so that they are functional as discovery tools in the archive would involve plotting out and performing each, oh, rather all of the possible paths of navigation. The scale and complexity of achieving that manually would be unfeasible. I've initiated several tests using web recorders automated browser tricks crawler, but with limited success so far. I watched the number of pages the crawler has identified grow in inverse proportion to its progress through the task. Meanwhile, the VPN connection periodically shuts off and the timeout errors tick up. So if we instead take the decision to omit the URLs that retain their complex pathways between indexes, tags and objects, then it will be very important for us to annotate the archive, explaining to future users that some routes through the collection are accessible and others are not. Archiveweb.page doesn't currently offer the facility for annotation that its previous iteration did. I frequently used list descriptions in the now phased out web recorder desktop app to signpost problems and give guidance. I fed this back to archiveweb. Um, the archiveweb developer team, but in this case, I think we'll need to devise um, an alternative method. So now the work just continues. Thank you.